Good afternoon. On behalf of Dean Parrish, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Hall Lecture today. This lecture series honors Jerome Hall, who was a beloved faculty member at our school from 1939 until 1970. He was a pioneer in the interdisciplinary analysis of legal problems, and his scholarship on criminal law and jurisprudence was internationally recognized. Though he died in 1992, his work is still cited regularly today, it's a legacy many of us would aspire to. Professor Hall's focus and approach has a deep place in our institution's history. Our faculty continues to embrace Hall's commitment to the interdisciplinary study of law in their research and writing and through the work of our centers. The Center for Law, Society, and Culture in particular carries on Hall's legacy. Professor Hall believed that we can best understand how law develops and how it interacts with society by examining the law through different disciplinary lenses, which allow us to see its historical, economic, political, ethical, and cultural contexts. He also believed that a true culture of democracy requires an informed citizenry that's capable of talking and thinking about the law. It's fitting that Professor Samuel Isakaroff will deliver the Hall Lecture for 2016 because he has made a major contribution both to interdisciplinarity in legal scholarship and to an understanding of the ways in which law interacts with democratic politics. Professor Isakaroff is the Reese Professor of Constitutional Law at New York University School of Law. He graduated from Yale Law School in 1983 and after clerking, he worked at the Lawyers Committee for International Human Rights and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, litigating politically charged matters like racist gerrymandering. He began his teaching career at the University of Texas, where he held the Joseph D. Jamail Centennial Chair in Law. From there, he moved to Columbia Law School, where he was the Harold R. Medina Professor of Procedural Jurisprudence. And then he moved to his current home at NYU. Professor Sakharov's scholarship has made him a leader in a remarkably broad range of legal fields. His early work focused on employment law and behavioral law and economics. This work was recognized by his induction as a fellow in the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His more recent scholarship has included work focusing on issues in civil procedure, particularly related to complex litigation and class actions and work pioneering the creation of a new area of constitutional law concerning the political process. His groundbreaking casebook on this subject, The Law of Democracy, and his many articles have helped to change the way lawyers think about voting rights. And his most recent book, Fragile Democracies, extend, extends the study of political processes to consider the role of courts in decision-making over these foundational issues in countries that are struggling to build stable democracies. In addition to his impact as a scholar, Professor Sakharov has also continued to be actively involved as a legal practitioner in his areas of interest. He participated in some of the leading cases concerning mass harm and complex tort litigation, and he served as the reporter for the principles of the law of aggregate litigation of the American Law Institute. He's also been active in the world around the issues of democracy and politics. Indeed, we rescheduled this lecture because he is on his way to Russia next week to participate in a technical advisory team on issues related to the ceasefire in Syria. <coughs> Today's lecture is entitled The Emerging Rule of Reason in Voting Rights Law. Please join me in welcoming Professor Asakharov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I think that that's about as gracious an introduction as I've ever gotten. It uh, <coughs> makes me feel old. Um, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, the topic uh, of this lecture uh, is something called the emerging rule of reason in voting rights law. And the topic is, uh, the title is deliberately obscure. Uh, it's not intended to inform. And uh, so I have the aspiration that in giving this talk, uh, 
I can meet that standard. Uh, and so, so let me begin with um, uh, some observations, three sets of observations. The first one is I'm here in Indiana. Uh, Indiana's in the Seventh Circuit. So let me uh, uh, raise some questions uh, that the Seventh Circuit has articulated in a series of cases uh, most recently. Fortunately, um, I am not uh, going to pick on any particular opinion by my law school classmate, David Hamilton. I will uh, leave my critiques to, uh, to some of his colleagues. But uh, it's an important point to make because we're here in Indiana, and uh, some of the most significant recent voting cases uh, dealing with the simple capacity to cast a ballot have come out of Indiana and Wisconsin, two Seventh Circuit uh, jurisdictions, uh, states that were not part of the Jim Crow Alliance, states that were not part of the Confederacy, states that, as we have come to later, were not covered by Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the preclearance uh, uh, apparatus that was put into place in 1965. And yet they have become some of the central places for litigation of the modern right to vote. So in a recent case um, called Frank v. Walker, uh, came to the Seventh Circuit out of Wisconsin and had to do with attempts to change the voter ID requirements in, uh, in, uh, in that state. And the court, the district court held a very long trial and made all sorts of findings um, that the law was uh, probably discriminatory, would probably have a discriminatory impact, and was ill-motivated in all sorts of ways. And it goes to the Seventh Circuit, and the Seventh Circuit divides on it. And there's an interesting uh, set of, uh, of arguments between uh, Judges Easterbrook and Posner, which, uh, for those who follow the, that particular brand of jurisprudence, means it quickly escalates into uh, high points of principle and some name-calling. Um, uh, in particular, uh, Judge Easterbrook questioned the validity of a study published in the Harvard Law Review by two co-authors of mine, Steve Ansela Bahir and Nathan, uh, Nate Persley, on the grounds that it was published in some trashy law review and hadn't been peer-reviewed in a proper fashion. And so, anyway, it's kind of amusing, kind of fun. But Easterbrook says the following. Any procedural step filters out some potential voters. So if this photo ID has that effect, it only means that a voter was unwilling to invest the necessary time. The district court judge in Indiana uh, thought, just as the judge in Wisconsin has found, this is comparing the Crawford case, I'll come back to it in a second, that some voters would be unable as a practical matter to get photo IDs, but could not ascertain how many people were in that category. The trial in Wisconsin produced the same inability to quantify. Now, this is a very interesting observation because what Judge Easterbrook is doing is saying we should think about this the way we would think about a disparate impact case in employment. And in a disparate impact case in employment, we would turn largely on the evidence that one group was disadvantaged relative to another. We would question how statistically robust it was. We would make all these kinds of findings. And then we would say, aha, there is enough to show disparate impact that blacks are adversely affected by this uh, hiring standard, or there's not enough. And for Judge Easterbrook, this did not meet the standard of robustness necessary for a disparate impact case. Let me compare that to an opinion by Judge Wood, Chief Judge Wood, Diane Wood, in the Indiana case a few years ago, Crawford, the one that went to the Supreme Court on Indiana's voter ID. And she dissented from the denial of rehearing, and she says, when there is a serious risk that an election law has been passed with the intent of imposing an additional significant burden on the right to vote of a specific group of voters, the court must apply strict scrutiny. The law challenge in this case will harm an identifiable and often marginalized group of voters to some undetermined degree. The court must look further. So this is Judge, Chief Judge Wood applying a different branch of discrimination law, something that, in, again, if we went to employment, we would call disparate treatment, right, that there is – uh, it's not so much that there's a statistical disparity, but that the statistics may help bear out that there's animus involved here. So you have 
the impact side of this and you have the intent-based side of it. And again, we have many areas of law where we know how these tests have been developed and we can see the dispute between uh, Wood and, uh, and Easterbrook in this fashion. Let's go back to Frank V. Walker, the Wisconsin case, and we hear a, a third approach. And this is from Judge Posner and he says, There is only one motivation for imposing burdens on voting that are ostensibly designed to discourage voter impersonation fraud. That is, that was the justification given that you don't want people showing up pretending to be somebody else, so they have to show a photo ID. And that is to discourage voting by persons likely to vote against the party responsible for imposing the burdens. In other words, we have yet another approach from Judge Posner, which is a pure motive-based approach. And so this is now three different uh, approaches. One, again, if we want to draw the analogy to employment law, one would be a disparate impact, one would be pattern or practice uh, for a disparate treatment, and one would be pure malevolent intent. And so that's how the Seventh Circuit framed this. And I'm going to come back to Judge Posner in particular, but I'm going to suggest in the course of this lecture that there's a different set of approaches that are being developed in other circuit courts around the country, which may provide a more fruitful way to think about this problem. That is the problem of why is it that we're making it harder for people to vote right now? Is there really a demonstrable uh, existence of voter fraud, or is this simply ends-oriented manipulation of the voting rules for some other purpose. But let me make two other observations before I come to this. And that is to draw attention to uh, to three puzzles. So a few years back in 2012, 2011-2012, um, I was uh, working for uh, the uh, Obama for America campaign. I was one of the lawyers for President Obama in 2008 and 2012. And Ohio is a pivotal state in uh, presidential elections. I'm not giving away inside secrets. Uh, It just happens to be. And uh, the Secretary of State had engaged in a course of practices from 2006 on, a man by the name of of Houston, uh, making it just harder to vote. And on the eve of the 2012 election, uh, he decided to scale back on the capacity to vote early. And this is a big development in the United States. About a third of the population votes before Election Day. And in some states, a very substantial portion does. Oregon has gone all the way to only mail in voting. There are no polling places in Oregon. So there's a a sea change going on in how we cast ballots in the United States. And so the paradox is as follows. Um, I was one of the people in charge of litigating this case. And I'm handling it from New York. And I'm saying it is unconstitutional for Ohio to scale back its early voting. It would be outrageous to go from 40 early voting days to 35 early voting days. Let me tell you that from New York. Why do I stress New York? New York has no early voting. New York has the worst voting laws in the United States. And so how can it be unconstitutional in Ohio to ratchet back? And in New York, it's constitutional to have none. Second paradox, in the North Carolina voter registration litigation, League of Women Voters versus North Carolina, North Carolina says we're going to have some reforms and we're going to do away with certain experiments. So, for example, in North Carolina, they allowed 17-year-olds who were high school seniors or juniors to early register so that when they became 18, they would be registered voters right away. And it was a chance to try to get them while, you know, they're in the civics classes and to get them engaged and start thinking about their, their responsibilities as citizens. Great. Come reforms do away with the early registration for 17-year-olds, challenged under the Voting Rights Act. New York Times editorial, my hometown. Uh, Horrible, horrible scaling back attack on the right to vote. This is outrageous. Guess how many 17-year-olds can register to vote in New York State? None, of course, right? All right, so, you know, you can say this is just New York Times hypocrisy, but... It's just something a little troubling. Why are they doing this? Why are they scaling it back? Why are they making it harder to vote? Third one, uh, Texas, where I used to live. VZ v. Abbott, a case uh, involving challenges to the new Texas voter ID regulations. 
you have to now show an ID to vote in Texas, and you have to have a state-issued ID. It has to be something official, a driver's license, a concealed weapons permit, something that the state issues in its august wisdom in, in the state of Texas. Well, that's horrible. That's got to be challenged under Section, under section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. It would have been challenged under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. But what's so terrible about it? I found that uh, I have a, a country house in Connecticut, and there was a local referendum on uh, some land use issues. And Connecticut is one of the few states that says if you have a second home, you can vote there, even if you vote if your primary residence and your congressional voting, presidential voting is somewhere else. So I went to vote in my small town in, tech, in Connecticut, feeling very American. You know, this is like, it was almost, almost had the feeling of a, of a town meeting in old New England. And I walk in, and they say, of course you can vote, and that's great. Let me see a picture ID. <laughs> you know, okay, take out my driver's license, and it's a photo ID. And it's a photo ID to get into NYU building. It's a photo ID to get into the ACLU offices in New York. It's a photo ID to get into the Brennan Center in New York. But it's unlawful in Texas, right? Well, how can that be? Okay, third observation. And this has to do with my uh, co-authors on the Law of Democracy book. So Rick Pildes uh, and I were lawyers together uh, in the Obama campaign in 2008 and 2012. And as we were going into the uh, Obama for America v. Husted litigation, Rick said to me, how is it exactly that you frame a constitutional claim as to something that, to which you have, as to which you have no entitlement? Right? You don't have a constitutional entitlement to vote early. Otherwise, New York State would be you know, there for the pickings on constitutional litigation. How do you frame the entitlement? Second conversation with my other uh, co-author on this, uh, Pam Carlin. And Pam uh, took time off from uh, uh, her role as a professor at Stanford to run the voting section of the Justice Department. And we were flying somewhere together, and I said, tell me how justice is going to handle the litigation in Texas. How exactly are you going to go after the voter ID stuff there now that you don't have the preclearance regime of Section 5 after uh, Shelby County? And she said, well, we're going to craft a claim under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is a very specific provision of the act, which was designed to allow challenges to multi-member election uh, jurisdictions, to multi-member districts, which have a tendency when you cast many votes as opposed to parcelized votes, it over-rewards the majority and under-represents the minority. And so this has been a subject of, of attack from... Uh, about the 1970s forward, and in 1982, the Voting Rights Act was amended to allow this. So it didn't fit the right to vote. And so how do courts uh, get around this? Um, so that's the paradox I want to address, and it's also um, the same doctrinal issues that were present before the Seventh Circuit in the Wisconsin-Indiana cases, but other courts have taken a slightly different tack. And so let me give you uh, two or three examples uh, quickly. One is the uh, VZ v. Abbott, uh, which is the Fifth Circuit case that I mentioned uh, uh, a minute ago. The district court thought that it had to make all the findings that were required in the opinions of, of Judge Easterbrook, Judge Posner, and Chief Judge Wood. And so the district court found discriminatory intent, found discriminatory motive, found discriminatory impact, found it all. And it goes up to the Fifth Circuit, and the Fifth Circuit reverses on the discriminatory motive, reverses on many of the findings, but upholds striking down the Texas law. And they did so in, in, in a novel and very interesting way, in a rather conservative panel, by the way. And so they said, first of all, on the motive, don't go there. They said, we recognize that evaluating motive, particularly the motive of dozens of people, is a difficult enterprise. We recognize the charged nature of accusations of racism, particularly against the legislative body. But we also recognize the sad truth that racism continues to exist in our modern American society despite years of laws designed to eradicate it. So they say, if the question is, was this racially motivated or not, that's the wrong question. 
you're always going to find some, but it's not going to be dispositive in the modern era or unlikely to be dispositive. Don't be distracted. Instead, the court said, let's handle it using a different set of legal tools, a, an initial two-part test followed by burden shifting. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So the two-part test is it said, is this likely, not is it proven, because it's always prospective, so you can never quite get the proof. Is this likely to have an effect on discreetly vulnerable minorities, right? So now we've got the Caroline products imagery going here, discrete and insular groups. And has there been a history of past wrongdoing against this group? So you have a very simple inquiry. So is this likely to affect minorities more than non-minorities? And does Texas have a history of discrimination against uh, African Americans or Mexican Americans? Well, the second is sort of a no-brainer. And the first is, yeah, you know, it, it, it probably will because minorities are less likely to have IDs. It's not a huge number. It's not a huge disparity, but they are less likely. So that's enough, but that's not enough to condemn it. That's enough only to ask the next question. Here's the great burden shifting move. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? That's the burden shifting. It's very simple. Here's the prima facie case. And then the second part is, okay, just state, tell us why you're doing this. And what's interesting about the VZ opinion is, as Pam Carlin anticipated, uh, the court tried to force this into the framework of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, what's called the Thornburg v. Jingles analysis, or what's called the Senate report factors from all the things that had been considered salient in voting rights cases. The least consequential in all the history of voting rights cases was something called tenuousness of the state policy. That was a nothing in the litigation because who knows, you know, what's, what does it mean? We want to have at-large elections versus district elections. How do you know if that's tenuous or not? The court picked up on this and said that's the key because that under the Voting Rights Act gives us the hook to ask for the justification. And so they asked, what is the need for the state policy? And the state would say, well, it's to combat fraud. Very well. What evidence do you have of fraud? It's to combat this. They say, very well, what evidence do you have this? It's to combat a certain kind of fraud, in-person voter identification fraud. You've got to be nuts to engage in that kind of fraud. You can go to jail. You can, it's a felony. And are you really going to tip the election? You want to tip an election, you go to some senior citizen home and you get, put some rum in the t afternoon tea and all of a sudden the votes all come in your way. You don't do it retail, you do it wholesale. This is So the court struck that down. Now let's go to a different body of law altogether. No voting rights act stuff at all. Obama for America versus Husted, the case that I worked on. The court made a very similar move in trying to figure out burden shifting. So in the first instance, and here's what the, here's what the court said it was doing. A court considering a challenge, this is the Sixth Circuit, to a state election law must weigh the character and magnitude of the asserted injury to the rights protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendments that the plaintiff seeks to vindicate. That's one side. So what's, what's, what's at stake for you as an individual? The other side, the precise interest put forward by the state is justifications for the burden imposed by its rule, taking into consideration the extent to which those interests make it necessary to burden the plaintiff's rights. That's a very familiar burden shifting uh, move, set of moves under American constitutional law. It's even more familiar to foreigners because this is almost the exact articulation of German style proportionality analysis. And so you have the court saying, let's get out of the classic discrimination framework. Now, the issue in, in, in uh, OFA versus in Obama for America versus Husted was more complicated because they said, we're going to scale back early voting, but we're going to allow military folks who happen to be in from overseas to vote early. And so now, is that a protected class? How do you show impact? Could you show that, that you know, it's true that blacks had voted more heavily on the Sunday before Election Day, but how do you know they wouldn't vote two weeks earlier now that you closed the Sunday before? All this, and, this, and the court said, no, 
Court said, show an impact, limited impact, this is going to be a restriction on the right to vote, and then shift the burden easily to the state for justification. Now, the state of, of Ohio was very poorly represented at the first stages of litigation and kept coming up with different justifications. And here's a simple rule of litigation. It's true you can plead in the alternative, don't, uh, right? <laughs> you know, just give one answer and stick with it. Don't, when you have 10 answers, uh, you're done. Same thing in, 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 uh, in North Carolina and the uh, League of Women Voters versus North Carolina litigation. They did an even crazier test. They said, we're going to take a balancing test, a burden shifting test, and the first step of it will be premised on the Sixth Circuit's decision in Obama for America v. Husted. So we're going to take one element from the constitutional test, and the second side will be based on Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act litigation from Thornburg v. Jingles. So they created a melange of standards from different bodies of law to find that there was no justification for, uh, for, the, uh, for what was done. Now, so what gives? And here's the, where the rule of reason comes in. As you get more senior, it's really, it really gets easier and easier to give lectures on things you know about. And I know a fair amount about voting rights. The trick is to give a lecture on something you know nothing about. And so that's what I'm going to turn to now because that's more interesting, more of a challenge. I think that what's going on in the voting rights domain is that the courts are doing um, what the federal courts did in the antitrust domain 100 years ago. And the antitrust laws, like the Equal Protection Clause of the, of the, uh, of the Constitution, or like uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the part that was struck down in Shelby County, are strongly prohibitive and directed toward one clear wrong. Now, in the case of the antitrust laws, these were written at the end of the 19th century to deal with the emerging huge cartels of the transformed American economy uh, after the Civil War. Listen to the language of the Sherman Act if you've never actually read it. Every, not any, every contract combination in the form of trust or otherwise or conspiracy and restraint of trade is prohibited. Every person who shall make any contract or engage in any combination or conspiracy hereby declared to be illegal shall be deemed guilty of a felony. You can't be serious. If I agree to buy a car from you in six months for $1,000, that is a restraint of trade. It obligates me to go to you in the first instance and not to somebody else. It obligates you to sell to me in six months and not to somebody else. Felonious? Are you kidding Every forward-looking contract, every output contract, every hedge, any sophisticated contractual instrument is on the face of this violative of the Sherman Act and gives rise to felony uh, culpability. Nuts. And the court, Supreme Court said as much in Standard Oil versus the United States. The court said that the statutory language standing alone could, quote, embrace every conceivable contract or combination. Clearly, we are not going to deem the marketplace a felonious enterprise uh, in the United States. So what did the court do? Two major changes in antitrust law that the court brought into bearing. The first was it developed something for that they called the rule of reason. And the rule of reason was an exception to what was called the per se wrongs. And the per se wrongs were the oil trust, the sugar trust, the tobacco trust. Those were the easy cases. The Sherman Act provided you the tool. It provided you the enforcement mechanism. It provided the criminal liability. It provided the civil penalties. It was all there for you. But then there was something called the rule of reason. And the rule of reason were cases that could have an impact on uh, on, combat, on trade, it could have an impact on the market, but they were the normal things that business people or, or folks like us do uh, every day. And the rule of reason watered down the prohibitory per se quality of the Sherman Act and said, we need a more sophisticated set of tools. 
Now, here's the move that where ignorance of antitrust law really helps because there's another branch of antitrust law that's used in the per se cases, in, the, in the, what's called the Section 1 conspiracy cases, that I happen to like a lot, and it's, it's the plus factors analysis. And the plus factors analysis says, you know, it's not a crime for the head of Coca-Cola and the head of Pepsi-Cola to have dinner together or to meet at the same country club or to in, uh, have a, a charitable event together. But if they're in a foursome and it's the two of them are there with two of their confederates and right afterwards something wrong goes happens, well, it's not that it's per se wrong to have to be part of a golf foursome. It's just that that's an opportunity, right? That's a plus factor. And so, too, it is not unlawful to raise prices in a, in a market of declining demand. But you better explain that. It's a plus factor. And so on and so on down a list of this. Now, I've been driving my antitrust colleagues crazy because I, since I got onto this, I, said, I keep saying, I don't see any difference between the rule of reason and plus factor analysis. They look the same conceptually, structurally. The cases play out, and they say, no, they're completely different. One's section one, one's section two. I say, yeah, 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 but, but what do you all know about what this means? And explain something to me about why that's significant. I'm still not persuaded. To me, they're the same thing, and so I'm going to take the liberty of combining them uh, for purposes of closing out this analysis. So the crux of the argument is as follows. Voting rights law as we've known it, whether under the Constitution or under the Voting Rights Act, is the product of broad and emphatic prohibitions. Um, classifications based on race are illegitimate. Easy application of the Equal Protection Clause, except we live in a more complicated world. Voting Rights Act, particularly Section 5, is designed for the South. It's designed for the Jim Crow jurisdictions. The trigger formula, as it's known under Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, was designed expressly to pick up every southern jurisdiction, and it did it exactly right. That's the part that got struck down in Shelby County. If you look at the case law under Section 5, the preclearance regime, it's all organized around something called Beer versus United States. Beer versus United States says that once you have an opportunity for three black majority districts in a jurisdiction, you can never go back to two. It's a non-retrogression. It's a fixed formula that says anything you do is suspect. So you put this all together, and what you get is a case law and a statutory framework and, indeed, a constitutional framework that looks a lot like the early Sherman Act. It looks very well designed, very well organized for the kind of problem that was present in the late 19th century. But as the market evolved, as we took care of those kinds of strongly uh, problematic combinations, you needed to modify this. You needed to make it more supple. You needed to make it have the flexibility to address a diverse sort of market arrangements. Well, what happens in the voting rights context? Why is it that the Fifth Circuit says, don't try to assign racial motive to this? Why is it that even Chief Judge Wood, in, in her opinion in the, Wisconsin, in the Indiana case, says, just see if there's impermissible motives floating around without signing it as the central or the exclusive one. And I think the reason is that no one believes that these prohibitions, new prohibitions on voting, these new restrictions on voting, making it more difficult, whether it's the scaling back of the reforms of the 1990s and 2000s on early voting, or whether it's the increased use of the voter of the photo IDs, nobody believes that these are really the product of Jim Crow. Nobody believes that they are really driven primarily by race. And why is that? Because they exist in Indiana, they exist in Wisconsin, as much as they exist in North Carolina. And until recently, they didn't exist in Alabama. And they, didn't, they exist in Kansas, but they don't exist in, they didn't until very recently, in Mississippi. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, it's because of a broader political dynamic. 
there have been two critical insights in, uh, that have changed the way we practice politics, or among two, two among the many, of the way we practice politics in the United States. In Florida in 2000, we learned that the rules of the game can determine the outcome. And so that changed every aspect of election practice. It changed the litigation practices. It changed how you structure the organization of just counting the votes, who gets to vote, absentee votes, all that mechanism. And the second is that at least in our period, there is a strong correlation between uh, turnout and partisan results in the election. So in 2008, roughly 60 percent of Americans voted, and we elected our first black president. In 2010, roughly 40 percent of uh, Americans voted, and the Republicans swept the table. In 2012, 59, 58 percent of Americans voted, and Obama handily wins re-election. The conclusion that's drawn from that, perhaps right, perhaps wrong, is that uh, maybe turnout is the friend of the Democrats and the enemy of the Republicans. And the reason that you get these restrictions in North Carolina, in Indiana, in Wisconsin, in Kansas, is because those are battle line states in which you have one party in partisan control of the legislature with an intent to suppress or diminish voting. That's, uh, you know, I, I, I know that I have a checkered history as a, as, a, as a partisan, but that's the reality. It only happens where Republicans are in charge. So what do you do about that? Well, the rule of reason says, of course, you're going to have some manipulation of the rules for partisan gain, just not too much. And then you look at what are the plus factors, again, to go back to the antitrust analogy, that the courts have figured out. Well, impact on vulnerable groups, absence of demonstrated need for change, historic evidence of disregard of that particular group. That's all fine. Proximity to election, a change on the eve of the election in in OFA versus Husted. That was a hugely important factor. Procedural irregularities in the adoption of the mechanisms. There was a committee that met late at night. There was no advance notice uh, pursuant to state uh, legislative processes. And one party control of the process without legislative debates. This all emerged from, from the cases. So let me conclude um, with another lesson from, from antitrust. And I learned my antitrust from Robert Bork. Um, and he wrote in his wonderful book, uh, The Antitrust Paradox, which was my introduction to this field, antitrust policy cannot be made rational until we are able to give a firm answer to one question. What is the point of the law? What are its goals? Everything else follows from the answer we give. Now, it turns out that to return to Posner, he was on to something in his opinion in the Wisconsin case. This is about partisanship. This has to do with one group trying to suppress the vote because it fears that the people who would have voted would likely have voted against them. That's got to be wrong, says Dick Posner. Now, this approach, is it partisan infused, is what's lurking in the background. And what's interesting about the cases that I've, I've cited, with the exception of the Posner opinion, is that they have refused to put this front and center. They've danced around this issue. Let me read you from uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Crawford, the, uh, the Indiana case. This is Justice Stevens. If a non-discriminatory law is supported by valid, neutral justifications, those justifications should not be disregarded simply because partisan interests may have provided one motivation for the votes of individual legislatures. We can't go around policing partisanship in the political process, says Justice Stevens. And so the question that, I, that I'm, I'm going to end with is whether this type of rule of reason approach under voting rights law can succeed
without addressing the core motivation for all of these laws right now, which is what is, how do we deal with an excessive use of partisanship to determine voting prospects in the United States? Um, it has been historically the one area that voting rights has failed to engage, whether it's in its inability to deal with uh, partisan gerrymandering. Again, Davis v. Bandemer right here. You know, we used to joke that, uh, that our book, The Law of Democracy, should have been called The Law of Alabama because Alabama so graciously made our careers. But Indiana, you know, is not, it's not bad. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not bad. So Davis v. Bandemer, but it's not just Davis v. Bandemer. Davis v. Bandemer dealt with some gerrymandering in Indianapolis. Guess what? There's an older case that comes out of the same part of Indianapolis, what in the old days was called the ghetto district of Indianapolis, according to the Supreme Court, a case called Whitcomb v. Chavez from 1971 that said, how come the blacks are always losing because, when, because, as a result of multi-member state legislative districts uh, in Indiana? And the answer that the court gave was, they're not losing because they're blacks. They're losing because they're Democrats. They should just vote for the Republicans, then they can vote for the winner, right? Uh, which is always my assessment of uh, the, jo the joys of voting. So I'm going to Russia, the joys of voting the, under the old Soviet Union, which is you got to vote for the winner and only the winner, right? And everybody got to vote, and you had to vote. And if you didn't, you were shot. So it was a wonderful democratic system. Um, so... To go back to Bork, uh, Bork challenged antitrust law that it would remain incoherent until it had an, under, an overriding theory that could explain what its interests were. For the Chicago School, for, for, uh, for uh, then Professor, later Judge Bork, that overriding theory had to be consumer welfare. Voting rights law hasn't come up with its equivalent of a theory of consumer welfare in these cases. It's sort of trying to get by in, a, in a sort of an ad hoc fashion, trying to say what's wrong without ever quite identifying what's right in this area, without fully playing out what's the affirmative right to vote, what's the state obligation. And it's an interesting process of watching it develop. I think that uh, the reason I started with the Seventh Circuit is the Seventh Circuit hasn't had as many cases and hasn't had as rich a history on this area of late as the Sixth Circuit and, uh, and the Fourth Circuit. And so the law is not quite as well developed in the Seventh Circuit, although the same issues are present here. Um, but when you look at the Fifth Circuit, when you look at the Sixth Circuit, when you look at the Fourth Circuit, what you see is a jurisprudence of reason emerging, something that looks like European-style proportionality analysis, something that says, basically, we understand that there's an impact, we understand there's a historic vulnerability here, and now we're going to change the jurisprudence to focus on why are you doing this? What's the motivation behind this? Not in terms of labeling it racist or partisanly aggressive, just why are you doing this and do you need to? And oddly, this has been in the last five, eight years, a remarkably robust area of law. Its vulnerability continues to be that it doesn't have the organizing principle, the organizing logic behind it, but it ties in so well to what courts do in so many domains that watching this emerge is, I think, uh, really seeing a rule of reason style approach come to an area, civil rights, discrimination law, voting rights law, that hasn't been characterized by this approach in the past. Thank you. So there's a little time left. I'm told that questions, answers, Ken? And uh, following the rule of reason analysis, uh, as I understand the rule of reason in antitrust law, um, it allows restraints 
in which the pro-competitive effects outweigh the anti-competitive effects. And so, as you were saying, you need some kind of overriding goal here. And I know nothing about voting rights law, so this may be ridiculous. But if the overriding uh, um, purpose of the voting rights law was to try to get accurate representations of the polity's preferences, um, then you could have you could say they can have this restraint because it does actually get rid of some fraud and that would mislead us as to what 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 uh, uh, the voters want. Uh, but you can't have other restraints because the pro uh, competitive effects don't outweigh the anti competitive effects. Now that would get you at New York, then, wouldn't you? Uh, you could say that a jurisdiction like North, like New York, they have a, a constraint that nobody can vote early. And the question would be, well, does that constraint actually increase the chance? Uh, uh, do the pro the pro voter voice effects outweigh the anti voter voice effects? And the answer would probably be no. They would have to allow early voting. How early the courts would have to weigh out because voting more than a year in advance would, I think, be ridiculous. But but they would have to allow early ver- early voting. Is that? I mean, is that? Uh, even I, I think that's exactly right. I think that um, what you're pointing to. So let me let me take this back a step. Most voting law was developed in the attempt to have hard rules, just like the antitrust law. Rules break down because you have absurd applications of it, and that's what the Supreme Court recognized early on in, under the Sherman Act. And then you have standards, and standards are things that we're we're comfortable with ju- judges applying. There are a lot of ex post evaluations of what the impact is and what the justification is. And what happens over time is the standards rigidify, and they start to look more like rules as the case law solidifies. So if this rule of reason were to be truly uh, internalized to the courts, I take your question to be, what's to stop it from then having more affirmative bite as opposed to negative bite and just say not you're doing this right now, that's wrong, but you haven't done this at all, and that's wrong. And I see that as a development down the line if this, if this persists. I think if somebody were to bring a case today in New York saying the lack of early voting violates the constitutional requirement of you know, equal treatment of citizens or whatever the, the theory is dressed up as, it would lose spectacularly. And it should lose spectacularly because there's not, we haven't tested the foundation. We really should be careful, with, I think, with judges coming in in the first instance and reordering something as difficult as how best to vote and things of that sort and what best satisfies a particular polity without some firmer foundation. But over time, case law develops that foundation, and it's certainly conceivable down the road that we would have the same kind of balance of do the, do the pro-protective side uh, outweigh the anti a participatory side or whatever the equivalent would be of uh, the antitrust analysis. Judge Hamilton? Thanks very much, and, uh, and this has been very, very enlightening, particularly to hear about what some of my colleagues have been up to uh, before I join this one. <laughs> it would be helpful, I, I think, if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between statutory and constitutional law with respect to voting rights. Um, With voting rights, we've got, with the Voting Rights Act, we have a focus on race discrimination and the history of of Jim Crow and the 1965 legislation. With constitutional theories, whether they're based on some kind of structural right to vote or equal protection or or First Amendment theories, um, I wonder if there might not be more flexibility to embrace some of the, some of your, the structure that you're suggesting. What comes to mind for me, for example, is that um, uh, uh, while I've certainly done my share of partisan politics in the past, the First Amendment has been interpreted to prohibit um, a lot of partisan discrimination in public employment, uh, and obviously that would extend to other public benefits as well. Uh, So I'll invite a comment. Uh, My view is, so now now you're, you're drawing me out, um, I suspect that this is some grievance from 30 years ago, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think the Voting Rights Act, to a very large extent, has played its part and has run its course. And I think what you're seeing in this litigation is 
the same set of tools, the same set of inquiries, the same judicial management of the of the process of the of the oversight process under the Constitution as under the Voting Rights Act. Now that Section Five is off the table because that was distinct. And so the the question is, do you need the Constitution? So the Wisconsin case that came to your court, you were not on the panel, but the, the Wisconsin case that came to your court was handled by the district court at both the um, under both Section Two of the Voting Rights Act and under the Constitution, and you would be extremely hard pressed to tell which part of the analysis was which, since this was exactly the same inquiry. I know you did. I know you. I know you did. But you, you, right. But you. But there were, you did not issue an opinion on that one. Um, and uh, uh, so, it, but it didn't matter whether you were under Section Two of the Voting Rights Act or under the Constitution. What I love about the uh, the North Carolina case, the League of Women Voters, is that the court created a test out of half out of the Constitution, half out of the Voting Rights Act. Almost oblivious to what it was, it, how absurd that is as a formal matter. And uh, but so what? They could have created that entire test out of the Constitution or out of Section Two of the Voting Rights Act. The Fifth Circuit created that same test entirely out of the Voting Rights Act by rewriting the statute around this tenuousness inquiry that had never been a central part of the statute before. So, so I think that. Um, uh, the the argument implicit in your question is the idea that there should be more flexibility for the judiciary to evolve the constitutional standards than there might be on the statutory side because Congress is an active participant. Well, you know, yeah, in theory, Congress is an active participant uh, in this process. I think that uh, that the, the more serious problem is that Section Five of the Voting Rights Act was aimed at race pure in the South. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act was aimed at at at-large elections. Sherman Act, Section 1, was aimed at, you know, the sugar trust. It wasn't aimed at my selling you a car. You know, it, it, so all of these things are historically confined and we've become much more accustomed to giving the broad contextual reading of the very broad formulations of the Constitution, equal protection, due process, so forth, than we have sometimes in the statutory domain. In this particular area, I really see no difference in the statutory and constitutional inquiries that most of the courts are doing are using at this time. And I would suggest that your court didn't really differentiate the two parts of the uh, lower court ruling in Wisconsin, and, and just if you look at, uh, you know, again the Posner versus Easterbrook, which was the main battle in that one, they could care less which one you're formally dealing with. They are dealing with is does this have a proven adverse impact? Easterbrook says the facts aren't there. Posner says, wait a second, this is malevolent, and that has no more mooring, I think, in the, con- in the statutory than the constitutional side. Yes? So I bet a lot of money that you thought a lot about what this theory ought to be and why it all the features of it might be. Uh, and I know this is not the time or place to lay that out, but I'd be really interested in hearing your tentative preliminary thoughts about what a, uh, what a new theory or what this proposed theory of the Voting Rights Act is. So... Um, I was supposed to give this lecture next week, so I would have had a completely worked out <laughs> answer to this. So you caught me a week uh, unprepared. Um, uh, I think that's a very hard question because it operates at many different levels. One is there's a structural problem that unlike other democracies, we let the inmates run the asylum, right? We let the partisans control the process. And if you look, for example, at... Um, uh, the Vienna, uh, the uh, Venice Commission, which is the European Union uh, advisory body for new democracies, one of the first things they say is election administration must be rigidly independent of any partisan engagement, right? They must be an independent body. In the United States, we distrust independence of independence bodies, so we give it completely to the lunatics, and we think that that'll cure it, right? At least it's obvious. So, That's a structural problem. 
Another structural problem is that uh, we've been too leery to assign to the states a burden of justification in this domain. I think that's something that's changing, and I think that that what's most fascinating to me about this development in this area of law is the willingness of courts to say, yeah, 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 they don't have an affirmative right to, why are you doing this? And that is a huge shift in the, the jurisprudence of rights, because the rights jurisprudence has always been I have this right. I must establish it. I must have a right to integrate schools, to gay marriage, you know, go down the road and all the things that, that, are, uh, uh, that have been before us. So those are two of the areas. But the, you can't underestimate the impact of the administration of the election system on this whole, on this whole problem. And post-Florida 2000, post the attention to turnout begin – really in 2004 in Ohio in, uh, in the presidential election, that has really changed the dynamics altogether. All right, well, it's perfect because we're just at the end of time. Thank you very much.